What's the matter, Henry? I've got to go and marshal. Oh, darling, you should have done that before you came to bed. Yes, but you see, you, you don't understand. You see, I promised Nick Syrett I'd help him at Brands. Sometimes I think you love that Nick Syrett more than you love me. You're joking, of course. <laughs> are on the start as the drivers take the limelight. But let's spare a moment to look behind the scenes of motor racing and to give credit to the stage management, the marshals. At every race meeting, a voluntary band of enthusiasts make it their business to see that everything runs smoothly. They have to be pretty quick on their feet too. It's their responsibility to report on incidents and to make sure that those that fall by the wayside are moved off the track. Oil on the course, the driver's greatest worry. But there's a technique for solving this problem too and the marshals sweep up between events. Centre of activity at any race meeting is the start line where the marshals find plenty to keep them busy. Full instructions are issued to officials, often written on both sides of the paper and sometimes down the edge too. Ken Blakemore takes the opportunity of showing drivers the latest copy of Playboy. And John Ellison makes a political speech. My friends, I do not come to you with vague promises. Back to the racing and a study of techniques at Cascades. Throughout a race meeting, drivers rely on the marshals. And if they get into trouble, the marshals are there to sort things out. The last spin of the day, and a bit of cross-country running for the marshals. The end of a hard day's work. And again, our thanks go to those who helped to bring us our motor racing, the marshals. Cadwell Park, scene of the Northern Centre's July race meeting. A new control building graces the start area of this popular two and a quarter mile circuit. Williams Lotus 7 gets its pre-race check by the scrutineers. And that's a haggis shooting machine, the new. There are two circuits at Cadwell, one for the small fry and the other strictly for the big boys. Cadwell is a tricky circuit. It's even difficult to get off the line sometimes. So let's take a look at the dodgy bits. Right out in the country is the gooseneck, 
a fast right and left that can prove a trap for the unwary. Now down to Mansfield Corner, where too much enthusiasm can turn things into an autocross. Into the mountain section, which provides unlimited scope for every kind of nonsense. That's Scott Davis, parking himself in a splendid position to see the next accident. but he's persuaded to join in the fun again. All bend, possibly the trickiest part of the course. The secret is to clip the apex and then drift out to skim the bank on the exit from the bend. At least, that's the usual way. No driver damage, but some modified body styling. Back to the start, for some more racing. But Alan Richardson started a committee meeting already. Go on ref, send him off the field. The timekeepers count off the seconds. And in case you're wondering, that means there's two minutes to go. Cadwell always provides excitement, and this meeting was no exception. Best place to see the fun is in the mountain section, where these marshals steal themselves for action. And there's plenty of action to keep them occupied. And now, for those wonderful men and their flying machines. That was Stamp and his Rochdale Olympic, claiming Cadwell high jump record. The Lotus Elan of Corner drops its sump on the track, just to make things really difficult. The oil flags are out, even on the slowing down lap and the marshals have a full-time job to clear the track and to lay cement. By the end of the meeting, it seemed that half the entry were on the end of a tow hook. And luckiest man was George Duncan, whose prop shaft came up through the floor and grazed his elbow. Here you are, mate with the compliments of a spectator with a flat head. To the West Country, Castle Coombe, the 15th of August. A strong entry, everything from an E-type. This is the Rob Beck car with Galaxy engine. To the ordinary shopping A40. Well, almost. Bert Lampkin calls for all marshals. No, Syret, not that sort of marshal. Ian Smith, Bert Lampkin, Eric Hammond and Brian Watts take it easy. While the sheriff gets together his posse for the day's roundup. The big sports car race promised a battle royal between Roy Pierpoint in the Attila Climax, and Hugh Dibley in the Brabham. But this nearly didn't happen, as Pierpoint had to make some last-minute adjustments to the car before coming to the line.
At the end of lap one, Pierpoint leads Dibley. But a suspension derangement put Roy out of the game on lap six. And as Dibley took the flag, Pierpoint retires to the paddock. The one litre saloon race, with minis inevitably to the fore. Through Quarry Corner, on lap one. Tricky holds off McDougal, but only just. Half distance and a spinning car blocks McDougal at Camp Corner. McDougal untangles himself, but the way is clear for Trickett to take the flag unmolested. The single-seaters and Chris Summers is halfway back on the grid after trouble in practice. But off the start, Summers carves his way through. Quarry Corner and Eccles in the Cooper Chevy is first round, with Summers catching up fast. So fast, in fact, that he took the marshals unawares on lap three, as he came through clear in the lead. That's Rig in the Lotus Maserati, wandering about in the crops. Meanwhile, Summers had set a new single-seater record on his way to claim first place. Throughout the day, the sports car boys had been gobbling up the tarmac, and some of the most exciting racing came from these classes. the track, the pace was hot. Most powerful lineup of the day was in the GT race. And all this excitement was beginning to tell on Southwood, who rather lost control of himself. Well, I suppose there's one in every club. The GTs move off in unison, with Ron Fry in his Ferrari holding on to the Galaxy engine D-Type. Side by side into quarry, but Fry makes a sizzle of things. The marshals stay respectfully behind the barriers. But Crabtree in his MGB makes a real effort to dislodge them. And out go the surrender flags. The racing's over, and Eric Hammond and Brian Watts take it easy, while Bert Lampkin clears up his knitting in double-quick time. Well, somebody has to empty them, don't they? To the Midlands, Mallory Park and the short circuit, where blazing sunshine made it real topless weather. Right, Gladys, I've taken mine off. How about you? Oh. I really must stop taking them tablets.
very relaxing for some. But Eddie Goodman had his hands full at the switchboard, keeping in touch with all control points round the one mile circuit. Man of the moment is Brian Fox as he drops the flag for the mini race. Now, for those of you who are new to mini racing, we should point out that it is a tradition amongst the drivers that somebody should spin on the first lap, if possible, at the narrowest part of the course. As the leaders tackle lap two, the marshals have around 45 seconds to clear the track before the field comes round for the second time. As the crunch wagon tows away the bits, it's time for a quick lunch. Darling, shouldn't we be watching the racing or something? To hell with the racing. I'd much rather lie here and... A notable feature of the club circuit at Mallory is the chicane, which is a real driver catcher. With room for only single file traffic, it's not the best place to run out of steam. The big GT race, and Tommy Hitchcock demonstrates the power of the Shelby Cobra. Taking the lead on lap one, the Cobra was never in any trouble. But trouble came in large measure to sparks in the Marcos. But his parking was immaculate, and the way was clear for Hitchcock to take the flag. Proceedings were held up for a while on the start of the single-seater race, as one of the cars had anointed the track with oil, and mopping up operations took some minutes. Lap one, down the back straight, and Eccles closes on Peel. And then, drama, as Featherstone demolishes his car at the exit from the chicane, but with only slight damage to himself. But let's go back and see the moment of impact. Skillful avoiding action by Mike White prevented a more serious outcome and the marshals cautioned the following drivers. With his car reduced to a pile of spare parts and some crystallized conrods, Featherstone has a big rebuilding program ahead. The flag goes out for Eccles in the Cooper Chevy after a dramatic race. A fitting climax to our visit and time to leave Mallory Park. into the transporter and away to Brands Hatch for the club meeting at the end of August. Down with the flag, up with the revs and we're in business on the short circuit at Brands. One and a quarter miles to the lap and a grandstand view for spectators. Down through Paddock Bend and up to Druids where the cars are momentarily out of view. Seconds later, and the field is accelerating along bottom straight. Round Kidney Bend, through Clearways, past the new score tower, and onto the fast top straight.
and it's Clem Greville Smith who drops the flag for race one. Paddock Bend, happy hunting ground for the Gilhooly merchants. The club marshals are out in full strength too. Back to the start, and there's a mini with its plug leads knotted. But all's well that starts well, and the small saloons are away cleanly. Along the top straight, nobody wants to lift off the paddock bend. And hardly anyone does. Druid's bend echoes to the patter of tiny tires. I wonder if you'd move your car, sir. We're expecting a race through here shortly. That's it. If you can't beat them, gas them. Brian Withers drops the flag for winner Goodliffe. Bill Webley and Don Truman set off on a lap of the course in the Ford Mustang. Between each race, the course car visits the marshal points to collect information on the incidents and to clear the track for the next event. Back to the start area, and the course is open for more racing. A short pause, while Nick Syrett acts as host to the son of the Sheikh of Bahrain. A quick chat to the drivers, followed by a brisk lap in the Ford. And it's good to see Syrett getting a shake on at Brands. Event 5, the Formula 3 race. Formula 3 has provided some of the best racing in 1964 and this event was no exception. lens and it belongs to club photographer Selwyn Smith. Even marshals have to eat but with a full program of events there's only time for a quick bite. Oh lay! American Tommy Hitchcock in the Cobra lines up for the Red X trophy race. Do you see what I see? It looks as if Hitchcock's in trouble on the line. I think the motor's all right. It's just that he can't get AFN on the radio. Away from the start, the Cobra out-accelerates the pack. And Hitchcock is well clear at Paddock Bend. Newton stopping to have his picture taken at Druids. But there's no stopping Hitchcock, who takes the GT lap record as well. Before the last saloon race, there's some clearing up at Druids, and Eric Hammond sweeps round the track in magnificent style. 
a thirst quencher for Steve Lovibond and Eddie Goodman. Back to the saloons for the grand finale. A last minute check to make sure there's no suspension. Alexander's Mini has a new style of cambered front suspension. We must watch to see what difference it makes to the handling. One man left on the line, but the rest scorch up to Paddock Bend for the first lap. Through Druids, and no quarter given. One five two suddenly finds that he's the only three-wheeler in the race. And talking of wheels, I wonder how Alexander is getting along with his new mini suspension. Ah oh well, that's show business. But he's completely unharmed. But the mini looks a bit sad. Meanwhile, our friend at Druids gets his wheel back. Well, that's the end of another hard day's fright. And we say thank you to the marshals and to the drivers. And we leave you with this thought. Try and cross the finishing line forwards. After six hours, the flag is out for the winning chaparral, and Ferrari have beaten Porsche for the sports car championship. <music> Phil Hill and Mike Spence are tired but happy after their drive in the winged wonder. And there's another winged wonder. This had been a great day for Hill and Spence, and a great day for the British Racing and Sports Car Club, who, with BOAC, had brought a magnificent race to Brands Hatch. Last visit this year is to Mallory Park, where the Midland Centre are at home to a full entry. John Truman is in command as usual as the saloons are flapping in the heat. Ken Blakemore, whose hooter gives everyone a start. Right from the start, it was obviously going to be one of those days when the track just isn't wide enough for all the drama. Woodman's Cortina scrambled home first out of that melee. And next away, the sports car race.
looks like a battleground, but nobody was seriously hurt. At this point, the drivers decided to take a tilt at our cameraman instead. it for another year from the British Racing and Sports Car Club. Drop along and see us someday, but mind how you park.